Super. Okay. Hey, Thomas. Hello, Steph. How are you? Good. Thanks so much for joining me today. You're very welcome. Oh, everybody, this is uh, Thomas McCormick, and he is uh, the Millennial Coach. And uh, later on, I will share all his tags and his handles so you can contact Thomas if you're interested in, in anything we talk about tonight and any of the services he offers. I'm going to stop the share now so everybody can see our faces. There we are, back to full screen. And um, so, Thomas, we had, a, we had a short five talks on Instagram that didn't work out very well for us. So for anybody who's seen part of that, um, just pause yourself because we're going to probably go over a few of the questions I already asked. But uh, we were starting to get into good stuff when Instagram let us down last week. So I'm excited to see what, what comes out. <laughs> <laughs> so am I. Can't wait to see where it goes. <laughs> see where this goes. <laughs> so Thomas, uh, as I was saying to you last week, one of the things I'm fascinated by is belonging. And we were having a great chat about you and belonging. And we started in school. So can you tell us again a little bit about belonging and how you found that journey to finding belonging and your tribe in this world? Yeah, so I think what I was saying last night, or last last week even, um, belonging for me, I obviously didn't um, know what belonging was as such when I was younger. But obviously since the coaching journey and figuring all that out, you're like, whoa, Jesus really showed up in a lot of places. Um, so for me, belonging very much so, um, very much so, I only felt it properly when I went to college. And prior to that, it was always an individual um individual conversations groups to a point but I'm the kind of person I guess who always um always I just I've always been better one-to-one -one. Yeah. um always uh so belonging for me to be honest I've been I was actually thinking about it since last week I was like um belonging is great to have but like I said last week belonging for me is never a place it's always the people yeah and for me it's always the people who like um who are willing to go against the crowd, yeah. who are willing to challenge the status quo, think a bit different, think outside the box, not afraid to express themselves authentically, which is a scary thing to do in a world of sameness. Yeah. And uh, they're the stuff that, that I guess them them people as such, I'd say, would now be my 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 tribe or the people that where I really, really feel belonging. Mm -hmm. um, and then if we go to go really deep into real belonging, I think... The best belonging, you know, the way they always say when you travel the world, uh, some people travel the world to find themselves yeah. and realize that when they come home, what they were looking for really was just a, a sense of belonging and comfort in their own skin. Yeah. So I think the ultimate belonging is um, feeling like you fully belong in the skin that you have and the life that you lead. It's a nice feeling, isn't it? Oh, it's, it's fun. That's yeah, awesome. it's nice. When you get it, it's lovely. <laughs> yeah, and when you haven't had it, because uh, when I was a kid, I didn't have it. In, in, in my 20s, I didn't have it. And to find it finally in my late 30s, feeling comfortable in my skin, like it's unreal. It's unreal what it empowers you to do and be when you finally feel that. And did you have that as a kid, that, that feeling comfortable in your own skin? Or did that come as life went on? Um. Looking back, I don't know what I, so if you ask 10 year old Thomas that, I have no yeah. idea what he would have said. Yeah. 18 year old Thomas, I think I would have been aware, comfortable at times and not comfortable at other times. Mm -hmm. um, looking back, I definitely don't think I was. Um, loved soccer and stuff. That was my place where I got to express myself. I was on a football pitch with a football mm -hmm. um, playing with other people. And then um, comfortable in my own skin one to one, in groups and stuff, I never really was. I think I mentioned that in the last week again, mm -hmm. the, the, the buses to football matches, never. Mm -hmm. I just, my, 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 what I loved in a conversation wouldn't generally come up in a lad's bus to a football <laughs> match, um, to be honest. Uh, so yeah, my, when I was younger at times, I think, but for the most of the time, no, I, I was, I had such a deep inner world. It's such a deep inner world that I really thought nobody got me. Yeah. And Looking back, they didn't. Yeah. <laughs> um, I didn't. I didn't. I thought everyone was supposed to think like me, but they didn't. So I was like, "What's, what's wrong with me?" And it's, there was nothing wrong with me. We just all think differently. And um, that deep inner world is a, it's a, it's a gift. But when you don't know about it, it can be quite the curse too. Absolutely. Yeah. And and is belonging important to you, or can you live without it? You know, some people are like, "Yeah, I don't care." Uh, how important is is it to you? I think. Geez, I think it's. I think it's a human. I think it's an, an innate, natural and human need. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's really important to me. Like it's important to me in terms of um, 
my family, uh, belonging as part of the family. And then it's important to me. Um, I think I don't know how. Obviously, I think it's different for different people, but mm. for me, it's terribly important in terms of um, having conversations where you feel like you can be seen and heard and say what you really think. Mm-hmm. Um, actually, our conversation last week sparked an incredible conversation I had during the week with a friend. Oh. Um, and we talked about that belonging piece when you're younger. And um, I'd never known this about her, but that just opened up the full, the full um, lovely conversation because of that conversation last week. And all around belonging and knowing that you're not you're not going to be fitting in so um mm-hmm. and the beauty of that and you're saying earlier about how the people you are attracted to are the people who don't like the status quo the you know the quirky types of people is is that is your family like that do you come from people who are quite comfortable being a bit different mm, no i would no i wouldn't have to be honest no i wouldn't mm-hmm. say so um no, not really. We're kind of, we're also, it's got, we're actually all so different. Yeah. Um, um, I guess our parents grew up in a different time. So I, I don't know, like they're pretty, you know, you're, you're, to be fair, there are two parents who have parents that ate kids. So they didn't have much of a, you know, <laughs> in my opinion, they ate kids. I'm like, fair play to you. Never in a million years would I do that to myself. Um, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Wow. <laughs> Madness. So uh, we're all, we're definitely, I guess all of us, the kids definitely have our own quirkiness and different things about us, but um, I've never thought of that, to be honest. Um, in our own ways, we kind of like to pave our own way for sure. Our parents yeah. always give us that kind of leeway. It was never to do a certain thing, to read mm-hmm. certain points. It was very much so around figuring out what's best for you and whatever that is, go and do it. So, so we you were given permission to do that. That's amazing. Yeah, yeah, we're very, very lucky like that. Yeah, because a certain generation of parents in Ireland, you know, it's about what the neighbours think and making sure you're going to mass and all that stuff. So it's great that your parents gave you that permission. Yeah, oh, the, oh, the mass thing might be there now, Dad as well still, but he's, he's learning. <laughs> <laughs> and where do you fall in the family of eight? What is your place in the family? I'm the oldest. Oh my gosh. So do you incorporate that eldest child thing? Because I, I really believe in that. I'm the eldest child and I think there's, I see similarities between myself and other eldest children. Oh yeah, it's like, uh, yeah, a hundred percent. When you meet them, there's just a natural, under, it's, it's like, yeah. I always think the subconscious understanding or um, my friends who are adopted will say they will be chatting to people who are adopted before realizing or knowing that they were, because there's just something yeah. that you see in them that you know, they kind of know more about you than, than uh, without it being said. Yeah. Yeah, I think there's some similarities, all right, in that eldest child sort of feeling responsible for the, I think sometimes we feel responsible for the world as the eldest child, you know, because you have that. I mean, you had eight, I mean, I only had one little brother, but with eight, so he must have been very responsible. Yeah, once again, something that I never fully realized until mm-hmm. I went into coaching that I had this huge sense of responsibility to other people that mm-hmm. wasn't mine to have. Yeah. Um. So great to learn to it's probably fairly ingrained in me but um uh, to learn to slowly let that go to realize the world is not my responsibility and other people's problems aren't my responsibility either yeah have you any techniques for putting that down because i am actually coaching uh, somebody at the moment in work and we talk about that a lot and um, how you know it's very hard to untrain yourself when you're that kind of person who feels like they should be the fixer and because you're the fixer then everybody comes to you to fix the problem and and when you've got a problem with boundaries and saying no to kind of you know so there's all this burnout that happens all the time as well when you're that kind of person did do you have any any insights as to how you managed to put down that feeling for me i guess it was definitely coaching and slowly over time and then the huge real it comes from the fundamental i think understanding for myself that everybody is so different yeah. sees the world differently and if people can't see what they need to see for themselves they're not going to change Mm-hmm. So people like that might, might be the people that people come to a lot. But when you have the same person coming over time with the same problem via different stories and they keep loading it on you. So now you've got this heaviness and they go away yeah. even better, but mm-hmm. they're not changing anything. It could simply be um, what's worked with me is um, just a, I know there's one example in particular in my head. Her friend kept coming and at one point said, look, you've come with this in different ways three times over the last three or four months 
if you don't change something about it, you're going to keep going with this, like to me, forever. So I'm just as a friend saying, do something about it or nothing's going to change. Because mm -hmm. like, I know I, I'm delighted I can be here for you, but it's nothing's changing. So, yeah. um, so whatever that conversation would look like for that person yeah. um, and just trust themselves to say it the way that it needs to be said. Yeah, and it's the idea of the monkey, isn't it? That I'm taking my monkey off my back and giving it to you to put on your back. Um, and uh, I'm just thinking there maybe a, a visualization for her would be great that, you know, am I taking the monkey? No, I don't want to take your monkey. <laughs> Hang on to your monkey. Um, so um, what was I going to ask you next? Oh, yeah. So you were talking about little Thomas a minute ago. What, what would 10-year-old Thomas say? If you could go back to 10-year-old Thomas, what would you tell him? Is there a message you'd give him? Oh, yeah. Well, if I could give him a message, I'd leave him a, a little note in a bottle. I'd try and verbalize it in a way that 10-year-old Thomas would understand it and get it. Um, and I, I think I'd just leave him a short message to say, do you know what? It's all going to be okay. Um, give everything your best. Keep your determination. Um, don't be afraid to be that caring person that you want to be. Mm -hmm. um when you like someone go and bloody say it to them don't hold back uh oh there's so much i'd say 10 year old thomas yeah I, when you're when you're too nice and too friendly sometimes when you're younger it gets kicked out of you um mm -hmm. for a variety of different reasons um so i think realistically you know what i i actually just think i'd leave a short message being like it's all going to be okay just trust yourself as much as you can every step of the way that's I think that's exactly what I say did you worry as a child for, you know when you're telling yourself it'll be okay did you did you would you have needed to hear that when you were little uh in yeah I was because I went to see I went to a primary school in Bal, which is my first primary school four years there it was great but I very much so felt that I really felt the being different there then I went to a different school and it was a lot smaller, so it was good. But um, yeah, I definitely needed to be told it was okay. I was always, I think, searching for that belonging part, mm -hmm. trying to be like everyone else. But sometimes, um, and I wouldn't have been one of the people that stood out in particular, but mm -hmm. in my own head, um, that was my perceptual reality, if you want to call it that. So um, yeah, I definitely needed to be told. <laughs> definitely needed to be told it was okay, I think, yeah. yeah. Did you... Um when you were a child uh, and I only asked this because I had I had a problem with this did you embrace your childhood as in your childishness because I, I felt when I was younger I was such a worrier I was almost too grown up for you know I look at my eight-year-old now and look at how nothing bothers her and she's always singing and messing and laughing and I wasn't like that when I was eight um do you recall having that childishness that you know that joy other kids have I, uh, I think when I was younger, it came for me in the fact we neighbours, especially when we moved to Bernicar, we'd uh, neighbours, um, uh, Louise, Quiva, Christina, there's loads of them just up and down the road. And we just used to, um, you know, go gallivanting around the roads. There used to be a little yeah. shop down the road and, you'd, you know, you, if you had two pounds, you'd be delighted. And you could just be going out getting sweets and going off eating them somewhere. Um, and then as we got older, we used to have, because we have a huge back garden, so get, all the neighbours used to come together and we just... And play football down the back garden for hours yeah. and it was class that I love that um yeah. it's where we're in the fact so when I'd be at if there'd be a lot of cousins stuff at the house I'd want to be at I want to be where the adults were yeah for a reason um so in terms of that yeah I get bored fairly fast so I want to go in with the adults and see what the hell they're talking about <laughs> but for the most part no I have to say I think I was really lucky um man was very very conscientious um of like just she just has this I don't know what it is, just this incredible depth of love or something. Um, and I've never seen people with it quite the way that she has it. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, yeah, we're very, I think we're just very lucky with the parents. I'm by knowing that I'm very lucky with the parents that I have. So, and that way they, they met um, our childhood as childlike and uh, full of possibility as possible. That's lovely. How did they spread themselves amongst eight kids? <laughs> How do you do that? <laughs> I, I, I honestly, I, I genuinely don't know. With, with, not only did it spread themselves amongst all eight of us, but when I was younger, like I played soccer, I played Gaelic football, I played basketball, I played volleyball. 
Yeah. Like all of us were brought wherever we wanted to go because they yeah. knew themselves that the, the, the place where you develop and express yourself and learn about yourself the most is your childhood. Um, so music, football, sports, as much as possible. Um, but they also had their, you know, they also had their, 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 their boundaries in terms of no phones till you're 16, which was a really mm-hmm. tough decision to make considering the pressure was coming yeah. everywhere, and which all of us thanked them for. They didn't let us have uh, sugar in our breakfast, salt in our dinner, which I thanked them for because I don't have those cravings. Don't need it unnecessary. Like none of us really have any health problems because of the way they brought us up. The simplest things, tough decisions to make, stood behind them um, and always emphasized the important things. So. Yeah. You just uh, described a generational gap there now, Thomas, because no phones before 16. I think I was 20, 20 something when mobile phones came out. <laughs> <laughs> I just think it was that much. Um, yeah, it's 16. Yeah, to be fair, it wasn't that big thing for me because yeah. I think the normal screen phones came about two or three years before that. Bebo came out maybe when I was 16, 17. Yeah. Potentially. Uh, but then for like Liam, he's just gone He's just gone 17 in October. So he only has his phone a year in a bit. Oh, that was yeah. tough for him. Cause... That's tough because I know my daughter is hoping confirmation. You know, I don't know what she'd do with the phone, but like she's eight and she's like, can I, can I have one for my confirmation? We're like, we'll talk about it. We'll talk about it. But that's the age now. And I think that's far too young. So I think your parents are amazing for, I think um, we're we're very scared of the word no these days. I don't know if you agree with that, but I I see that everywhere in work and with parenting. The word no seems to be a real challenge for people, you know? Yeah. Or even finding other ways to navigate the way the word no. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Um, so, uh, uh, do you recall a life-changing moment, like no. where 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 something uh, big happened, or was your uh, awareness of yourself and this growing into your skin was it much more gradual for you? So, to be honest, I've had loads of life-changing moments. The one that came straight to my head when you said that there was um, where I go, where I went to primary school. There was an expectation that you go to the the all lads school in the town, the local town. And for so I had this big fear in my head for some, so, well, actually, I know someone said something in school and it stuck on my head and I had in my head, I was going to have my head ducked in the toilet half the day. So um, that was very real to me. And yeah. I remember going into the, the, the secondary school for, um, you know, you, you register and everything. And just, just this, co- I don't think this is the reality, but for me, it was, it was all ads. It was, um, it was an old school. Mm-hmm. And I, I knew they were very focused on sport which was fine by me but I wanted to go to education too which it also gives but my perception was wrong mm-hmm. um, and I remember walking out of there I'm not coming here no way um, and went dad arranged for me to meet the principal in Kelchma a different school mixed school and I walked in and it was just this lovely warmth to the mm-hmm. place and I was like yes I'm coming here that was a big decision because that put me on course just for getting to get better around socializing I there's obviously there's that balance of sexes so there's a lot more education social education you get going into college which set me up nicely for paths which which was majority girls mm-hmm. um, so that was a big moment there's been loads of moments um but the the oh, there's been so many moments um realizing that the job that i was in was a big one yeah. and, and having friends that kind of pointed out to me and yeah. like let's get the hell out of here um oh, there's, there's, to be honest there's loads because then um, uh, we talked before about your job change um when you came and were tutoring us uh, that, that first time i met you in, in the coaching course uh that's it's a great story um so i'm going to ask you to tell it again but um i've just done the career coaching course and and for me it's amazing uh i like you change careers you know a little bit later in life and it's amazing when you find the career that's meant for you it's literally like you don't work a day in your life you know and People think I'm so corny. I'm in HR now since I'm 32 and I still pretty much love every day and I'm still so passionate about it. But I do think it's because I came to it later in life and I knew what I wanted. Where when I was in, co- I was in college, I did a Greek and Roman civilization and history in Maynooth. Didn't know what I wanted. I just knew I liked history. Didn't know what I wanted to be. And um, it's so difficult when everybody else knows what they want to be at that age. And you're like 19 and you've got a bloody clue like, um so tell us a little bit about that that career change for you and how that how that happened because I think so many people are stuck in jobs they don't love yeah it's more it's unfortunately more common than it should be um 
So, yeah, so for me, I guess it was in college, I was running a lot of the events for the college. Yeah. And back then it was running events because you, you got to know everyone and it was a great way to meet people. So yeah. I ended up running the events that way. And I was in the SU for a year and then I left college and, and I had no plan, didn't know what I wanted to do. I was so in the past bubble, I didn't even think to make a proper plan for when I leave college. Uh, so, um, and I knew I didn't want to t do teaching. Um, based on my experience and uh, just from what I see my other friends go through etc and then um, then so I jumped into what I knew which was organizing events and nightclubs and filling nightclubs full of students like Monday to Friday Dublin Galway like everywhere um, with uh, three or four other guys um, but the purpose behind it had completely changed it had gone from running events because you love doing it and, and there's a buzz from it and you're around these people all the time to running events to, to make money essentially um, and there's a, even though the, technically the skill set's the same, mm -hmm. purpose and the meaning behind it were completely different. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, yeah, so that was slowly over time because I wasn't aware of it. So I started, mm -hmm. I was going out to the weekends a lot. Um, I was lucky that I was making like a really good income. So I, I was able to do that and I was able to, um, I didn't realize it, but I was distracting myself from, you know, parts of my body that were speaking to me. Yeah. Uh, telling me like, you need to see that something's amiss here um, and slowly but surely just over time I can I guess my my um my yeah my soul was almost just getting depleted or something um and even though other people a lot of people couldn't see it because they would see me when I'm on a night out when I'm connecting with others even if there's alcohol involved or not I would connect with others so I was I was on my was on my buzz it was amazing um and such a good time but then it just came to a place where it was draining you no matter where you are mm. like no matter where I was I just knew there was this wasn't me but it took a friend to come in and say Thomas you're not yourself you used mm. to come in here and like really add a lot of zest our life to a room but now you're kind of you know just like you're, you're not really here as such mm. and then another friend had a conversation with me he'd done the coaching um he'd done the coaching course and we were sitting out of the gate one day and he just started coaching me without me realizing so high level communication inside of the coaching sessions and he was like whatever he said then he said have you ever thought of life coaching i was like don't really know what it is like my full i think my understanding at that time would have been tony robbins-esque which wouldn't be my style at all yeah. and um he uh he just explained to me what it was, and was that sounds absolutely unbelievable i was like but you don't get paid for that stuff and he was kind of pointing out the fact that the fact that you were so excited about what I said to you is quite telling. He was like, other people would run a mile. Um, and it took me 12 months then after that to actually sign up for the course and do it. But when you talk about belonging, when I walked into that room after five or 10 minutes, even though I was the youngest, I think it was me and one other guy, um, mm -hmm. by a bit, um, just the conversation and what we were, it kind of lined up my belief anyway, that we are all different and we have a different way of looking at things. and people have their answers you just have to help them kind of look through the fog and see what's already there and I was like unbelievable this kind of lines up with my beliefs yeah. in a way that lets me express myself authentically too because I love being a listener um so yeah I don't you were talking there I was getting so excited as you were explaining the essence of coaching um because I, I agree with you it just it excites me so much when I see the penny drop you know that moment when people go oh my god I could do that all day I could do that all day all night just um help people find that clarity it's just so exciting for me and it's um it's because I've been coached as I'm sure you were I've been I've, I've been to counseling and I've been to coaching and very very different things but um the change that it makes in your life is incredible absolutely incredible so even even like a little bit of coaching can be have an incredible shift in in your performance and also how you feel about yourself because i think when we're tapping into our potential our self-worth just goes up and up and up doesn't it it's it, it's literally i i just think it's the gift that it's the gift that keeps on giving it's yeah. like everyone is brought into this world and the way society and is kind of structured it's structured in a way that everything is outside of yourself yeah coaching makes you aware of what you have and helps you see the gifts that you already have and if you could slowly over time because it like anthony it takes time uh, put these pieces together you start to realize that uh, just how to like press your expression buttons in the way that you show up best um for whatever that 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 might be um like i even 
I put I put a testimonial up yesterday and I got a few messages about it. But at the at the essence, and people are congratulating me, and I was like, oh, hang on a second, I I agreed. Like I, it's something I've learned to do is like, yes, I am good at what I do. But the essence of what this was was helping someone else see what they're already capable of and that they don't have to be anything else. Just lean into lean in harder to what's already there, but that that which you might not be able to see for yourself just yet. That expression lean in as well. I love that. And that's something that I've learned to do as time has gone on. But I think the coaching course helped me kind of really go there. And 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 it um and I what I notice is um with myself and with people I coach, you know, the coaching really teaches you, doesn't it? I, I learn from every person I, I meet. But um leaning into discomfort is an amazing skill um that so many people don't do and then they miss so many things because they haven't lent through that discomfort but also like you said that leaning into stuff that you're good at we don't do that either we don't sit with the good stuff we just like move, move through it move on move on and um it's so interesting to get people to just sit where they are and see what happens um yeah. you said something there as well i'd love to ask you about you said um i've gotten good at saying yeah i'm good at what i do how how long does it take you to get there um to, uh, honestly uh, uh, a while um like something i'm still i'm getting much better at it um but i'm working on it uh be, but it's yeah it's mm. taken a while um because from coaching i guess i've started to realize that some of my gifts are the things that have always been there the the reason that certain people like me and hang around with me are are also because it's coaching and it's so personal are also some of the things that makes me really good coach and for me to realize just because it comes naturally to you, some parts of it does not mean there's no value in it. So, mm. um, yeah, so it's, um, it's great. It also comes with the understanding that you're, you're not for everyone and you're not supposed to be. Mm -hmm. So it's, um, it's like there's, when you're starting out, you can, you can very much so, you can very much so think that you have to be a lot of different things. But when you, what you see over time is you have to kind of do it in your way because it's mm -hmm. the only way you'll get the people who get the most out of it, who get the best from being with you mm -hmm. and you love being with them too. Mm -hmm. um, and it's amazing. And that's one of the other reasons I love it because um, uh, like we genuinely, um, when you figure out what it is, every single one of us brings something into the world that nobody else can. Yeah. And when you, I guess, lean in or see what it is or realize that, to be able to get to that space where you can talk openly and freely and know that you're saying things that other people don't think or you're verbalizing things in a way that other people don't see. So when you, you're, you're doing that, it's like step into it and, and own it. And um, to be able to put your hand up and say, look, I'm really good at this is very good, especially in a culture that's very much so. We can all toot our horn or you can blow your trumpet, but whatever you do, don't blow it any louder than the neighbors because that would bring attention on us. So it's uh, going back to what you said about the different generations um, yeah. in the past. But yeah, it's um, people admire it as well. People, people, people like to see you doing it because I think at the back of their minds, they know, okay, so it's okay for me to do that too. Um, yeah, there, there was a couple of, so many things you said there I, I, I want to talk to you about. But one thing that I think I learned um, when I was being coached I didn't know what I was good at. If somebody asked me what I was good at, like you said, I, I, would, I wouldn't have a clue. I kind of knew I was good at what I was doing, but I, I, I didn't know what the parts were, uh, you know, and what made me good. And I was career coached myself. Um, I got onto a great um, course with work and it was over a year and a half. And um, I'd come home from each of those weekends, literally just bursting with new words for things. So I learned what I was good at, but I also learned, um, what do I do a little bit differently? And I got words. And when it's authentic, you don't feel like you're boasting. Where when it's not authentic and you don't have the right words, you feel like you're just like selling yourself, which is a bit distasteful, isn't it? For, well, for most of us, it's distasteful. But it's funny, since I've learned the words and I know it's authentic gifts, I've been able to go, yeah, I'm really good at that. Well, I do that one. And, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm also, I'm able to say the stuff I'm really crap at really calmly because it's no big deal because I know I'm good at this stuff. So it's okay that I'm not good at this stuff where before that journey, I was trying to be good at everything, you know, like Bugs Bunny running around. Um, everything was only okay and average because, you know, you're spreading yourself too thin. Um, so it's, it's amazing, you know, if anybody's watching this, doesn't 
feel like they're good at anything or it doesn't know what they're good at honestly a couple of sessions with it with a coach like thomas and you'll you'll soon know what your strengths are and what you bring to the world and it's it's very special um so move on to a few light things for a minute tell me do you have a guilty pleasure guilty. do you believe in guilty pleasures guilty yeah yeah 100 percent. i think <laughs> human experience we have uh, another robotic one so i think it's good uh Guilty pleasure. Um, do I have a guilty pleasure? I'm sure I do. I guess during COVID, I've probably forgotten, to be honest. Um, uh, I love, I love, I love, and it's not really that guilty, I suppose. I just love going for a drive and listening to Dermot Kennedy. I think he's unbelievable. Um, a guilty pleasure. Give me some examples. It yeah, so like, it's like a, a glass of wine on a Friday, a chocolate. Um, oh, one person told me in one of my tribe talks, uh, Dr. Pimple Popper is a TV show where you watch the doctor popping disgusting pimples. That's her guilty pleasure. When she's stressed out, comes in after like a, a long day, episode of Dr. Pimple Popper. <sighs> she's like, oh, okay. I was like, I've never even heard this. This is the best guilty pleasure I've ever heard. <laughs> and then other people say they don't have any because they don't believe in guilty pleasures because what's to be guilty about? I'll eat, eat chocolate when I feel like it. I'll drink a glass of wine if I feel like it. No big deal, you know? <laughs> yeah, I think, I've, I think I used to be the thing to go off and, you know, get a, a you know, a, a takeaway pizza or something, but there was a guilt with it. Whereas now if I'm having it, things like that, I'm like, nah, I'm, I'm going to enjoy it. So it's yeah. not so guilty anymore yeah so, um, so you changed your relationship with the word guilt then yeah there's nothing I guess just the whole coaching journey has brought me on that um like I when I was younger I used to be so obsessed with being like eating because there was so much talk around um uh you know the food and its impact on you and stuff so I'd be so strict to myself in terms of um wouldn't even have a bar like a bar like weeks before a game wow. uh so I don't really have too much of a desire for sweet stuff and all yeah. that. Um, but now it's like, if I'm having it, just enjoy it. And if you want to indulge, bloody do it. Yeah. And just, if you feel shit, be like, yeah, feeling shit. Um, but it's also that shit feeling that makes me not do it regularly. <laughs> uh, yeah, I know. Cause it, you, you stuff yourself and then you're like, eh, it's not really working. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's just it's self. It's a, I guess once again, to be fair, that comes back to the coaching journey of, seeing the self-sabotage, seeing what it is, see how you're actually just punishing yourself, understand it, and then it kind of slowly dissolves. And it's if you're, if you're doing it now, you're enjoying it as opposed to like the self-sabotage, the punish, the, yeah. the guilt. That's a great way to put it, that it slowly dissolves. That's exactly what it does. When you name something and lean into it, that's exactly what it does, actually. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, it's, um, so if you're feeling down, I don't know if you ever feel down, but if you are feeling a little bit, mm, you know, lost your mojo, feeling down, is there anything you do for yourself in particular when that happens? Yeah, um, no, I did. Jeez, no, I definitely feel down um, at times. COVID, especially the second round has been tough, I have to say. Yeah. Um, just the human connection part is like, yeah. I knew it was important. I didn't realize, how, like, I knew it was important, but me and one of the lads went for a walk around the lake in Clamaris there a couple of weeks ago, and both of us ran into people that we knew on a bank holiday Monday. Mm -hmm. I was like, like it's like I don't know, kind of. This might be a bit of an exaggeration, but it's like we were given the gates to heaven, like just because it was, um, just because it was so nice to bump into people, and those simple conversations were everything. Um, but when I'm down these days, um, it's a walk or what I've learned to do for myself, um, because the overthinking thing will come in. I've learned overthinking and more thinking doesn't help anything, so it's literally slow down and stop. And uh, there's this there's this Reiki uh, lady on YouTube. Can't even remember her name actually. Um, uh, but what I do is I I listen to her for a half an hour. And it's just because I'm very sensitive to, to to sounds and feelings and energies and stuff. It just soothes my whole nervous system. I think. Um, and then I'm fine. Um, uh, and the big thing about being down for me is it's always thinking. Everything goes back to thinking. Um, so I came across. Um, a thing called the three principles um, uh, over well over a year ago at this stage and to be honest that has changed my mind and helped with so many things um, because I, I see I see now the true nature of thought um, which is something we can never control 
Um, and yeah, it's been simply, you know, I used to go on to a, a good example to give people um, is I used to be the person before a talk, I'd be really, really stressed. And I was giving a talk uh, last September last year to open one of those stadiums in not Santry, it's national something or other. And they said, oh yeah, there's going to be 1500 people here. So I was preparing for this talk with two days in it, two days notice, stressing out like mad. I went on stage and I actually really enjoyed it. But mm -hmm. the stress from the two days could, when I watched it back, you could, I, I could see it in my face anyway. Yeah. Um, and this new understanding helped me show up for a talk on authenticity um, a couple of months ago without doing much preparation and feeling total, to, a total like peace of mind with myself. And I gave the whole talk without preparing, like thinking things through in my head, not really preparing nothing. Yeah. And it's always important for me, as opposed to leaving people with practical steps, but to touch their heart in a way that they know what they need to change without me telling them. And it was the best talk I've ever given. I didn't stress at all. I didn't, I have to say, I wouldn't say I was nervous either. Um, I, I think nervous are a good thing, um, but they weren't there. I was just so a can. Um, so if there's anyone looking to wonder how can I get that feeling as opposed to that way of thinking, mm -hmm. um, look up a guy called Sidney Banks. Um, he'll either be for you or he won't be for you. Yeah. But if he is for you, don't listen with a note or pen and paper. Listen with, just give yourself that time. And if you get a feeling, know that you've heard something that you haven't heard before and it's the truth. And that's, that might sound a bit daft. I can't believe we even said it here. But it's very, um, it's very, very, uh, it takes away a lot of the extra stuff we think we have to do to calm our thing. I'm so going to look up that because that would have been my thing for years is the overthinking. Um, Eckhart Tolle really helped me um, when I discovered him. Uh, that was one of my life changing moments. I had so many in my life, but that was one for me. Um, and I would have had huge anxiety and um, overthinking problems. Like, you know, those things where you're like, having that same conversation 20 times in your head because you'll at one point you'll change the past if you keep you know thinking about it yeah. over and over again I'm sure I'll change what happened this afternoon by you know <laughs> chewing yeah. on it all night long so uh yeah that would have been a big issue for me and Eckhart Tolle really helped me so I'm I'm definitely gonna look up this guy because I think all I can do is improve my peace of mind and what a gift being at pieces like when if if you're listening to this and you've ever been a person that wasn't a piece and then you found peace like you'd never give it away for all the money in the world would you like you know, it's just it's just the best thing to have um yeah. and then you can spread it to other people when you've got it as well which is wonderful yeah no it's amazing um yeah. i'm not saying i have it all the time i definitely don't yeah. but um uh yeah it's a beautiful feeling to have to know that uh, the, it, that it exists regardless of what you're going through but you always seem very calm, Thomas. I mean, you know, I came in here straight after work and my shoulders were a little bit up there. And uh, I, as you would have noticed before we started recording, I speak very fast when I'm, you know, kind of on the buzz and literally sitting here talking, listening to you. I, I can literally feel my shoulders going down and I'm feeling much calmer than I was. And, and, and I put up that message on Instagram during the week. Uh, it was from my sister. And, she said, I've never switched off as quickly on a Friday night after listening to Thomas for a few minutes. So you, you do have this extraordinarily calm presence um, that you manage to share. It's not just like you're just being calm in a corner, you know, all by yourself. You do have this gift of sharing it. It's, I'm sure you've heard that before. People told you that before. People have told me before, but it's only in the last 12, to be honest, it's only in the last 12 months when you're giving a talk and you're you're looking for feedback and your feedback is it's a thanks that sounds like a guided meditation i've never felt as calm mm -hmm. or my friend Eva has always said thomas i always just love listening to you it's something about your voice yeah. you, she was like you should sign up to that um what's it uh, inside time oh yeah or, uh, you should yeah um but it's great um it's it's to be honest, it is one of those gifts that i'm i'm lucky that i don't have to it's it's there for whatever reason and I'm lucky that when I'm, uh, I guess, I guess on the, I, I, I have a feeling it was already there, but I think with the, the coaching journey, it has made us more powerful. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's, for example, there's, there's one lady who came once, um, 
you know, people think I work with majority millennials, but this person would have been a, a good bit older. And like my age, Thomas, yeah. No, a good bit older. I think we're a lot closer in age than Stephanie that I think. <laughs> 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 uh, <laughs> but uh yeah, she 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 left the room and we were walking out of the car park and she turned to me and she stopped me and she's like, I just want to let you know, and she named another coach who's phenomenal. Um, and she said, I just want to let you know that uh, I don't know that you fully realize the extent to what just happened in there. And it was something that was on her back, wow. talking in her head for 20 years and she'd never seen it. And she said something about your presence. I don't know what it is, but if you could box it, I'll buy it for as much as you have. Much as you want. So I'm definitely very lucky with this. It's something I definitely have to value more myself, but um, mm. I'm, I'm great that it's there and it helps other people. Mm. Can. can you hear that? Yeah, but it's cool. And I, I'm like so impressed that you're so calm with it as well. You know, other people would be stressed now. No big deal. Um, and that's the thing when you've got inner peace, like think about that. Things, you know, like like noise in the background. It's, it's no big deal. <laughs> it's yeah, it's, uh, honestly, it's um, like I won't say I have inner peace, but yeah. I... I um definitely the things like that it's, it's hard to explain but the three principles i have to say help me a lot with that stuff as in realizing the only thing i ever have control over is here and the thoughts that come into my head that make me angry they are literally just thoughts because mm-hmm. that person down there doesn't realize that i'm on a call but i also know that they don't realize i'm on a call yeah. exactly yeah yeah and like we're talking away and it, it doesn't detract if you know what i mean like you know it's uh and it's something as well, you know, years ago, things like that would irritate me. The noise around would irritate me. And, and I found it's been so much easier. I think age does have something to do with it as well. But certainly that journey of self-awareness, all you can fix is yourself. You cannot get stressed about all that other stuff. And um, do you remember in, in, in coaching, we did that whole circle of concern, uh, circle of influence. Um, like I apply that all the time in work and I apply it with other people in work. You know, if somebody's got a somebody comes into my office all like, you know really pissed about something I literally get them to put it on post-its like break it right down like even if they say something I get them even to break that statement right down and then we pop the post-its on the circles I have them up on my wall all the time and it's so freeing when you just put things in circles that I, know, I can't do anything about that I just let it go it's a it's a great exercise yeah it's um things like t- things like that and exercises like that are really good and then even understanding sometimes that for me anyway the frustration can come in when I, I i call it contaminated thinking yeah your thinking is contaminated with too much over the course of the day or something that was said and you haven't caught it and then low thinking brings in frustration so mm-hmm. it's okay well, or even if you look at it as a frequency or an energy um it's low and we're low look when it's low energy e- negative things are easy to cling on to you so what can you do to just for me stop let it go and the energy naturally floats to me mm-hmm higher frequency and then it's yeah oh that doesn't annoy me now okay i can have to do it my day yeah that's brilliant what excites you right now is there anything you're you're excited about happening yeah oh, i'm excited about so much um i'm really uh, to be honest for covid has been incredible um i like i have to say it's obviously there's these are the ups and downs for everyone for me i'm definitely excited about traveling again um i'm excited about um i've got really really clear on the people that i that i work with and i'm excited about being more specific about that i'm excited about just trying new things like i'm really open-minded when i say that i was on the phone to my friend and i was like whoa you are very open-minded i was like yes i am um so i'm trying, i'm looking forward to you know going to different places experiencing new things mm-hmm. open my mind up to things that i guess you know normally as you get older they say your your, your, your mind can get more concrete and plastic i think neuroplast neuroplasticity thing is um but uh, i'm conscious that i want to keep my mind open forever in a way that yeah. just ex- the more i experience the more it'll expand my mind the more i expand my mind the more open i can be and then the more the more um the more it becomes a lot easier to be non-judgmental because you're not you understand fully that we all have a different way of looking at things um to be honest experiences and people um i think would be the theme of my life getting as many experiences as i can and connect with many people in as authentic a way as possible pretty good mission where's the first place you're going to go i was thinking about this i'm either going to go to 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 bali or 
um, to India or to Central or South America. Cool. All those places, I don't know what they're saying. Well, I know Bali's fine, but the other two places could be a while, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, different cultures that are very different from my natural way of thinking. So yeah, think. yeah. And have you been anywhere um, before that? Like, what, what is your favorite place to go to where you had those kind of experiences? Anywhere uh, stand out for you? Yeah, Guatemala and Nicaragua. Oh, wow, yeah. Um, they were good. Uh, Cambodia. Wow. Cambodia was quite eye-opening. Um, but Guatemala and Nicaragua, I really loved because the, you know, people were so content with so little. And... Mm -hmm. It was lovely. It was real. They still had all the culture, like mm -hmm. the pebbly, not pebbles, but you know, the it's not flat road. And um, like Antigua and Guatemala, I loved. Um, yeah, loved that place. Where else? Was I? I was in Taiwan as well before, which is a completely different experience. That was yeah. absolutely mad. Um, sorry, loads of places. You got me thinking now. So yeah, there's loads of places. And are you a solo traveler, or do you like to go traveling with people? Do you know what I? That trip to Guatemala, Nicaragua. Whatever way I messed up my flights, I was spent two days on my own in Guatemala. Mm. That was my best two days of my holidays ever. Oh my god! I love spending time with groups, but I, I, I think I'm the person if I was going again, I go on my own, yeah. and then I've of the journey with other people. But more on, I just love meeting other people, and it's like I got to know the whole town of Antigua when I was on my own, and people, the lads were like, "How do you know everyone?" I was like, "God, I, spent two, I didn't spend two days looking at myself." So you know, the, I just knew loads of the, the, the bar owners and the, the, the coffee shop people. And um, yeah, it was, that's, I, just, I just have this curiosity for other people. And I think that's it's just a part of who I am. So um, whatever way I get to express that, I'll be doing it. Cool. Um, has lockdown changed you much then? Has lockdown changed me much? Good mm. question. I do think if the Thomas of today, I met the Thomas of the 1st of February, like he's definitely very different, not very different, mm. but I just learned so much about myself at, mm. a, at an exponential rate, I would say, because obviously I'm, I'm at home with the family at the moment. So if you want to go and learn things about yourself, that's the place to go. They're going to be the mirror. Um, I was in a, uh, seeing someone there for a while as well during the summer. I learned so much. Um, we were very calm in a lot of ways. So I learned loads that way. Um, uh, I've learned yeah I am a very I'm just much calmer I've surrendered a lot let go of a lot of things I'm not really too attached to any particular outcomes which is um, liberating so it's and actually I mean I would I never talk about dating with my guests but I want to ask you something not about specifics but about how has this journey has it changed the type of person that you now are attracted to compared to again Thomas pre-coaching oh yeah oh yeah definitely uh <laughs> big time my goodness yeah big time I guess pre-coaching yeah pre-coaching to, uh, to be honest pre-coaching I was so insecure on myself yeah. um I was so insecure on myself people could like a girl could come up and ask me on a date it's not I'm not saying it happened or anything but if they did even if they were the most beautiful thing and the most beautiful personality in the world I'd be looking over my shoulder going, yeah, don't, don't know who you're talking to. <laughs> I'm not here. Um, whereas now, um, now, yeah, the type of person would definitely be different as well, definitely. Yeah. Um, now it's very much so people are open-minded and they, yeah. they're excited and they're, they're ambitious and they're independent. Yeah. And um, they, they're open to creating something in the future as opposed to having a fixed idea of what it is. Yeah. It's, we, we can't know what the future holds. And I always personally find it better when we open our, our mind to what could happen as opposed to being fixated on something we don't know yet. Definitely. Sounds cool. Um, do you have a favourite book of all time? Uh, favourite book? I mean, Chooses and Mari, probably. Oh, that was my first one of those type of books ever. I, I remember where I was sitting reading it. And I was in such a bad place when I was reading it. And I was like, this is, this is like, God is literally talking to me through this book. I'll never forget the experience. Still sitting there, I've got a shelf of my favorite sort of self-development, but I don't know what, no, what to call those books, self-development books or spiritual books or whatever. And oh. I think I call that book a book of insight into the fact that even though that was written 20 or 30 years ago, the problems that society seemed to have then are the same ones that we have now. Um, yeah, 
yeah, that or I read, read Matthew McConaughey's auto. But I don't. He, he doesn't want to call it an autobiography. But I read Green Lights. Incredible. Is it? Yeah. Oh, oh it's on my list. I absolutely love it. He doesn't do it in, as in, oh, look at me. He just speaks so honestly about his experience. Yeah. Um, he's, yeah. um, he's a cool guy. He seems to really have his, have his values in the right place. He talks very, back. very strongly right, about values, principles, yeah. and don't let anyone uh, shake you from your path. Yeah, yeah I looked that book up. Um, what do you love about social media? What would you change? You're great with your social media, I have to say. I, what do I love about it? Um, what do I love about it? I guess there's, de there's definitely, there's inspiration on it, I guess, for sure. Um, you can, what do I love about it? Um, yeah, there's inspiration. I guess you can definitely stay in touch with people mm -hmm. via the app. What would I change about it? Honestly? If I could change it, I'd go back to whenever Mark Zuckerberg had his bright idea, whenever Instagram was founded, and I'd make sure they'd never seen the light of day. Um, I know there's a lot of people can say there's a lot of benefits. I just think, yeah. I think the negative side of um, them has impacted on way too many people, and we have no idea of the impact. So for me personally, whether it's and if it's my business and stuff or not, I just don't think it's worth. Mm -hmm. Like we're creative people, we'd have found something different to make the world a better place without having yeah. to. I know Mark Zuckerberg says they connected the world. I think they've disconnected the world more than they've mm -hmm. connected the world. They can frame it however they want. That's my opinion. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think, I mean, I, I like it myself, but I, I wish I was as um, control, self-controlled about it, you know, as you are. Um, uh, yeah. I think it's uh, I don't think it's good for our brains and I think it's certainly not good for our children I, I mean obviously I was raised pre Facebook so I didn't have my 20s on Facebook I don't think I would have coped well yeah. the kind of person I was with yeah I don't think I would have coped well with Facebook in my 20s even my early 30s so um yeah I think uh, I think it's tough for anybody who's got any kind of self-esteem problems you should stay as far away from social media as you can you're just constantly speaking to your insecurities yeah. yeah yeah absolutely um and it's i mean i look at sometimes i'm, I'm looking at my phone and going, how do i waste that time when i could be doing something else so there's that as well like the, the time wasting um if you have a shameless plug what would that shameless plug be for shameless plug yeah um, for myself uh shameless plug i'd say it would be if there's anyone out there mm -hmm. who feels like they're they, that they're not fitting in or that they maybe underneath it all they know that they're made for more yeah. um they might be they probably have a a big heart in a big way um it's really important for them to connect to their life in a meaningful way with purpose uh, and with a sense of authenticity all of which might have been lost over the last five or ten years for whatever reason mm -hmm. um i would say that i guess those are the people that i work with best um be it career be it starting a new business whatever it might be the, the, the essence of the person who I love working with and who gets the most results from my company. Um, that would be the shameless plug, I guess. That's a wonderful shameless plug. But again, you have a great way with words. And um, yeah, I mean, you don't say an awful lot, but what you say is so good. Like, so good. Um, who else would I, should I interview? Is there anybody that you would like to see interviewed? To be honest, there's so many. <laughs> yeah, there's loads. Um, so there's, there's a guy, I don't know, is he, I don't think he's in your course. Um, he's a lovely guy. He's over in, he's over in Vietnam and he coaching once again, made the difference from, and he upped his bags, left living over there. He's an incredible story. I'll leave it to him. If we get in touch. Uh, Jonathan Kiley is his name. Yeah. I'm sure I'll try and think of the people that I, that, cause there's some people I know you'd have heard of yourself. So, um, Let's see who else. There's, yeah, this is a, there's a girl called Kira O'Malley from Mayo, and she has an incredible story as well. She, oh. yeah, an incredible story. Um, it's a grief story, but coming out the far side, um, and it's quite, quite deep. But she speaks of it in such um, a strong way. Like there's there's the, there's not there's no pity or any of that there. Yeah. She just tells her story in a very real way, and I think it'll really. Um, 
tingle the uh, the heartstrings of any human, especially those who've dealt with grief. Um, she said, oh, to be honest, there's loads. Uh, there, there's a man, there's a man and a woman. Um, uh, yeah. Tribe. Yeah, they're, I guess they're two. They're the two, they're two great, they sound like two great ones. I shall get the details off you and, and get in touch with them. Um, my final question then is, is there anything that you would like people to know about you that you don't think they already do? Uh, that's a great question. That I would like them to know about me. Oh. Such a good question um, that I would like people to know about me. Um, let's see. Jeez, I don't know. Um, I'd like them to know. Uh, I, actually, that is, you've stunned me with that question, to be honest. Um, you can it overnight and let me know. Yeah. But are, you, are you more an open book, though? Because um, we were doing an exercise for, for my choir recently, and... Um, we were to give three facts people don't know about me. And I was like, I'm an open book. There is nothing people don't know about me. <laughs> I can't think of anything. <laughs> yeah, I am. I would have been a very much so an open book. Yeah. Now I've become a lot better at, um, I was okay at reading the room, but now I'm a lot better at reading what the room is open to and what the room is mm -hmm. not open to. Because mm -hmm. um, I can be like, it? yeah, it's, um, mm -hmm. it's just, it's, I guess it's a, a thing in the past I was very open, but maybe without realizing, not being respectful to what people wanted to hear and not wanted to hear. Yeah. Uh, it always came from a good place, but I just mm. wasn't aware at times. Um, so, yeah. So now I'm kind of, I don't, yeah, I don't, I like to not dwell on my past too much. And, you know, the only person I ever am is who I am in this moment. And after that, everything falls away. So, yeah, I don't know. I might come back to you on that one. Yeah, I'd like to hear what you, what you have to say. Well, Thomas, thank you so much. You hang on there and I'll just say goodbye to whoever has kindly watched our video. Um, guys, at the, uh, uh, with the video, you'll see all of Thomas's uh, tags. I'll make sure his website is there and his, his Instagram and all that kind of thing. But thank you so much for watching us and um, we will see you next time.